In this section, we take a look at what we call the pigeonhole principle. Um, it's a counting technique, not necessarily a technique to count things, but to establish or show that uh, the number of things has to be uh, like maybe a, a approach a certain minimum value. Um, and it's useful for solving certain types of problems. Um, so it's, it's stated quite simply like this. Um, suppose we have n plus one pigeons, but we have just n pigeonholes, and I'm trying to split the pigeons up into the pigeonholes. At least one hole contain must contain more than one pigeon, assuming that I'm I'm not you know we assume that we're not uh, cutting up pigeons and putting a fraction of a pigeon inside. That means that at least one pigeonhole has to contain two pigeons if I'm going to place all the pigeons into pigeonholes. Um, and the proof is pretty simple. So first, let's suppose. Let's suppose that each hole contains at most one pigeon. Um, in this case, if that if that's the case, and we have just n pigeon holes, that means that there cannot be uh, more. You know, we can't have more pigeons uh, than pigeon holes. So. And that would mean that we can't have more than a total of n pigeons. And that is a contradiction, right? We have n plus 1 pigeons. So the contradiction implies that at least one hole contains more than one pigeon. Um, we can generalize this. Um, to say that if we have just more pigeons than pigeonholes, so we started, you know, the statement is n plus one pigeons and n pigeonholes, but as long as we have more pigeons than pigeonholes, um, then we can say that at least one hole has to contain more than one pigeon. Um, so let's, uh, let's do an example. Let's prove that uh, if we have a list of m plus one positive integers, then at least two have the same remainder when divided by m. So let's let... Um, a1, A2, uh, let's see, we have m plus 1 positive integers, so a sub m, a sub m plus 1, be a list of positive integers. And um, what we're going to do is just use the division algorithm for each of these. So let's suppose that for each um, a sub i, so where i ranges from 1 up to m plus 1, um, that a sub i is m times q sub i plus r sub i. So we're using the division algorithm um, to find a quotient and remainder. So that means if we're finding that remainder, this r sub i is between 0, uh, let's see, is 0 less than or equal to r sub i. So r sub i could be as, less, as small as 0 and has to be strictly less than m. So And we know that for any integer I want, I can use the division algorithm and find a quotient and remainder when I divide it by m, and that's what we're doing here. So that means once we've done this for all of these a sub i's, we now have a list of remainders, right? So r1, 
R2 up to R m r sub m plus 1 um, is a list of m plus 1 non-negative integers that are less than m. We know that there are only m such uh, integers. So we have m plus 1 integers in our list. There are only m distinct integers with this property. And that means that two of these r sub i's have to be the same. That's by the pigeonhole principle. And if two of those r sub i's are the same, that means that two of the a sub i's leave the same, uh, have the same re remainder when divided by m. All right, so in this next example, let's suppose that we have a couple of finite sets, a and b. And a has more elements than b does. We're going to show that uh, there cannot exist a one-to-one -one function f that maps from a to b. So let's let f be a function you know, just some function that maps from A to B. Note that A is the domain of this function, so every element of A will map to some element in B. Um, and let's also uh, let the size of B equal N, so we'll su we're just supposing that B has N elements. So now take the set B, We've got a bunch of elements, right? We've got n elements, and then we're just going to look at the pre-image of, of each element. So we have n sets in A that consist of the pre-image of the individual elements of B. Um, so that look like, let's see, there are n sets, n sets in A that look like the pre-image of some element of B. So this pre-image is the set of, uh, the pre-image of the element B is the set of all x such that f of x is equal to B. So it's the set of elements in A, right? So this would be an element in A. It's the set of elements in A that map to that particular element B. Um, and we have n of these sets for each element of B in B. Okay, furthermore, because A is the domain of this function, meaning I can, any element of A, I can plug in and it'll send me into B. I can see A as the union of these sets. So A is the union of these pre-image sets, where I just let B, little b, range through all the elements of B. Okay, so now we're almost done, actually. Um, A contains more than n elements, right? That's part of our supposition. A contains more than 
n elements, which in order for all elements of A to be accounted for in this union right here, then at least one of these f inverse of b sets um, has to contain more than one element of A. So let's say A1 and A2 lie in the same set. Well, what it means to say that they lie in the same set, the, the same pre-image set, what it means to say that is that f of A1 is equal to f of A2, and that means that f cannot be one to one. All right, so here's another example. Um, we've got five points that we're going to place on a rectangle that's six by eight inches. And we're going to show that there are two points that are not more than five inches apart. So I'm going to start this one, actually kind of be, be a bit visual in how we think about this. So here's our rectangle that's six by eight. All right, so we've got uh, eight inches by six inches. And the first thing I'm going to do is divide the rectangle into quarters. And we're going to do so not we don't just want four equal parts. We want to we want to draw this out in a clever way, well, in a useful way. Um, we're going to draw them out uh, into four rectangles that are that are three inches by four inches. So we're drawing it out this way. So each of these rectangles is three by four. So, all right, now we have these four rectangles. That means then um, now we place the, the five points. We only have four rectangles. So that means that there, mu there must be two points that lie in the same rectangle. That's the pigeonhole principle. Now if you take a look at uh, one of these rectangles, right? So without a loss of generality, let's suppose that the rectangle that has two points is this one in the lower right. Um, the furthest these two, the furthest two points could be and still be in this rectangle are at opposite ends of this diagonal. And this diagonal uh, you know, is the is the hypotenuse of a three by four triangle, and that's five units apart. Um, so the two points that are lying the same rectangle uh, cannot be more than five units apart. So in this next example, we start with the set X uh, that contains the positive integers from 1 up through 2n. So X contains 2n positive integers. And we're going to let S be a subset of this that contains n plus 1 elements. So note that it contains precisely one more than half of um, the elements of X. We're going to show that there are two elements of S 
such that one divides the other. So we're going to start with an observation. Um, first, we'll observe that every positive integer uh, can be written in this in this form two to the r sub i times q sub i, where q sub i is odd and positive. So essentially what we're doing is we're saying any integer, any positive integer, segregate out all the factors of 2 so that the only remaining factor is odd. For example, um, I'll just do a quick um, uh, couple of examples here. Um, suppose I had um, uh, the integer 40, that's even, but I could factor out all the 2's, right? So it's 8 times 5, so this is 2 cubed times 5, and then there's our Q that's odd and positive, or um, the integer 84 is 2 squared times 21, right? I'm taking out all the 2's so that the remaining factor is odd and positive. I don't have to factor it all the way down to primes. All, all I just wanted to make sure I grabbed out all the 2's. Um, if an integer is, is uh, odd to begin with, like say I have the integer 117, well that's 2 to the 0 times 117. So I could still write any positive integer in this form where I take out all the 2's, kind of segregate out all the 2 factors, and then, uh, and then see what odd factor remains. So every positive integer can be written in this way. Um, we're going to express each element of s in this form and then basically look at the collection of these q sub i's that we have. So let's express each element of s in this form. So this will generate a set of those q sub i's. So I've got q1, q2, q up to qn, and qn plus 1. So s contains n plus 1 elements, so I'm going to have n plus 1 of these q's. So this set contains n plus 1 positive odd integers. Think about where this set came from. Um, there are only n many odd numbers that are less than or equal to 2n, right? I mean, in, in, the, in the set x that goes from 1 up to 2n, precisely half of them are odd. So there are n distinct odd integers in the set x. Um, and so in this set of these q sub i's, I've got n plus 1 odd integers uh, less than 2n. There are only n distinct uh, integers with that property. that are less than, or I should say less than or equal to, actually just less than 2n, it's not going to be equal to 2n because that's uh, even. So there are only n odd numbers, odd integers that are less than 2n, so that means two of these q sub i's have to be the same. So let's say q sub i is equal to q sub j uh, for some i not equal to j, right? So two of those distinct, two of these numbers in the list have to be equal to each other. Now let's bring these q's back to the numbers that they came from in s. Remember, each of these values for q came from writing each element of s in this form, right? It was this odd factor left over once you took out all of the um, factors of 2 that you could. Um, so that means there are two 
two integers, two elements of s. I'll call them a and b. Let's say a is 2 to the r times q sub i, and b is 2 to the s times q sub i. I'm using the same q, right, because we're saying that these are the same. So I've got the same odd factor. I just know they might have different um, powers of 2, right, that, I was, that, that we took out. Now, um, for one of these, right, I mean, we've got 2 to the r and 2 to the s. For sure, we could say either r is less than s or s is less than r. Um, without a loss of generality, let's say that r happens to be less than s. Then if r is less than s, they have the same odd factor, but a has fewer factors of 2 than um, than b does. And so that means that a divides b. And just to show this uh, maybe in a little bit more detail, let's say r is less than s, right? So here's a little side like extra steps here to kind of convince you that a has to divide b. If r is less than s, let's say that means that s is, you know, r plus k, right? Um, then, then s is equal to, oh sorry, not s, then b is equal to 2 to the r plus k times q sub i, which is 2 to the k times 2 to the r times q sub i, which is 2 to the k times s, uh, sorry, 2 to the k times uh, a, because this is equal to a. And so we have b is equal to 2 to the k times a, and that means that a divides b. Theorem 316 is the strong pigeonhole principle. It just makes a slightly stronger statement. Um, and the first part uh, says if we have m pigeons and only n pigeonholes, right, more pigeons than pigeonholes, then some pigeonhole contains at least this many pigeons. So you just do the division and just round to the next highest integer. Um, and that just sort of gives you a floor on, even though we're using the ceiling function, it kind of gives you a floor just saying some pigeonhole has to contain at least this many pigeons. Part B is another way of saying a kind of a similar thing, um, but it says suppose we have M uh, pigeon, or sorry, N pigeonholes again, and, um, and we have M pigeons, right? So always M pigeons and N pigeonholes. And if I kind of divide this up into M1, M2, imagine we have the N pigeonholes here that we're accounting for minus n plus 1, this tells us that for some i, the ith pigeonhole contains at least m sub i pigeons. Um, this is kind of a confusing way to, to say that it's how we can kind of construct a, a worst case scenario to help us solve certain problems. Um, and just because we kind of get lost in a sea of subscripts, I think. Um, but it basically says, kind of try to imagine like splitting them up evenly, and then eventually you kind of have to double up on pigeonholes or like or, or contain a certain number of pigeons in order to have all of your pigeons accounted for. Um, and we're going to see this at work in the next example. So I'm going to kind of uh, show how we can think of it in terms of uh, part B here. Um, in terms of these m sub i values, um, and then also just kind of how in practice I tend to think of this part of the strong pigeonhole principle. Suppose, uh, so let's suppose we have an urn, um, and it's got 10 red, 10 blue, and 10 green balls. All right, so three balls, 10 of each. How large a sample must be taken from the urn to be sure of having a set that has at least four red or five blue or six green balls in the sample? So I don't need four, four red, five blue, and six green. I don't need all of those. But just for at least one of these conditions to be met, right? Um, so in terms of the last theorem, um, in this case, balls of the same color is equivalent to having pigeons placed in the same pigeonhole.
we have three pigeonholes. We have the blue pigeonhole, the green pigeonhole, the red pigeonhole. So that means n is equal to 3. And we want to have four red, five blue, or six green balls. So that means that we have m1 is 4, m2 is 5, and M, uh, M3 is 6. Right, I want, I want M1 to be 4, or M2 to be 5, or M3 to be 6. I want that many pigeons placed in that particular hole. So the number of pigeons that we have to draw, the value M that we're looking for, that theorem says it's M1 plus M2 plus M3 minus n plus 1. So let's see what that gives us. 4 plus 5 plus 6 minus 3 plus 1 is 13. 13 pigeons or 13 balls must be drawn. So, you know, there, there we are using, you know, the equation that we have in part B of the strong pigeonhole principle. I'm going to think about this problem again. We're going to solve this problem again kind of um, in what I find a more intuitive approach. So, and the way that we're going to do it is kind of by constructing a worst case scenario. Like, what's the maximum number of balls I would have to draw before I'm forced to have one of these conditions met? So, imagine, you know, let's construct that worst case scenario. So let's suppose I'm, I'm taking balls out of this urn, and I start out and I get three uh, red, and then the next one, so I'm close to having that one met, but then, uh, and then, but then I don't get any more reds. Then I get like four blues, right? So I'm one away from getting those five blues. And then the next one, I just need a red or a blue and I'll have it met, but I don't get a red or a blue again. I get, I, I proceed to get five green balls. Right? So by this time, I've got 12 balls that I've drawn. Now I'm guaranteed that the very next ball I take out of that urn is going to, you know, tip the scale so that one of these, I'll either have four red, five blue, or six green. There's our worst case scenario, plus one. And that gives us the 13 balls that we need in order to guarantee that one of these uh, conditions is met. And this is equivalent to what they say in part B of the strong pigeonhole principle um, because in this equation right here, right, where we use that, that um, part B, that equation that we get in the strong pigeonhole principle, part of this is you subtract n. So you subtract the number of pigeonholes so I'm subtracting three, but that's like taking these criteria, right? We want to meet at least one of these. So we have four plus five plus six. But it's like saying, suppose I just come up one shy of each of these. There's my minus three accounted for now. All right, which gives us the three plus uh, four plus five, right, that we, that we got when we kind of when thought about it a little bit more intuitively. Um, so that's saying, you know, come one shy of each of your goals, and then, you know, you need to add one, which is what we did here. All right, we're going to finish up uh, this section with an example. Suppose we got six people in a room, and suppose uh, with these six people that given any two of these people, they're either friends or they're enemies. Then we're going to show that there are three people who are mutual friends or three people who are mutual enemies. So um, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to pick one guy, pull him aside. We're going to call him A. All right, I'll just call him A. So let's pick one guy. So now then for each of the other five people in the room, they're either a friend of A or an enemy of A.
So let's put uh, the friends against the north wall. Let's put A's friends against the north wall. And A's enemies against the south wall. So I've got these five people. I have now kind of partitioned them, some against the north wall, some against the south wall, by part A of the strong pigeonhole principle. Um, one of these walls, uh, either, either the north wall or the south wall, has at least three people. And that three comes from in this in the strong pigeonhole principle. You know, we have five pigeons here. Those are the the people, the other people in the room, and the two pigeonholes are the two walls, the north wall and the south wall. So three comes about by computing five over two and applying the ceiling function. So one of these two has to have at least three people. So we're just going to take each case. If there are three people on the south wall. then one of the following must be true. Either uh, these uh, three of these people are mutual friends, in which case we're done, or this wall contains two enemies. And if that's the case, then these two, along with this person A, are three mutual enemies. So if the three people are on the south wall, we know that the conditions met. We either have three mutual friends or three mutual enemies. If there are three people on the north wall. Then one of the following has to be true. Either there are three mutual enemies, in which case we're done. Or Or there are two friends. And in that case, these two people, along with person A, are three mutual friends. And there we have it.